So have you heard this one? A French Canadian guest staying in a hotel in Edmonton phones the concierge and orders some pepper. Will that be white pepper or black pepper? The concierge asks and the answer comes, toilet pepper. <laughs> Timing, it's all about it. timing. All right, here's another one. Question, where were you born? Answer, Newfoundland. Question, what part? Answer, all of me, of course. <laughs> John, you do this for a living? <laughs> and then, here's this capper. What do you call the most beautiful women in Sudbury? Tourists. <laughs> Not me, John Robert Colombo. So, uh, I mean, to call John Robert Colombo prolific would be a severe understatement. 130 works, is that right, John? Largely devoted to the lore and literature of Canada. I got to read this in detail. According to the University of Toronto Library, he has. 46 books of poetry and poetry anthology, three books of aphorisms, 12 books of Canadiana, six quote books, six reference books, five compilations, five works of fantastic literature, 23 books of humor and lore, eight surveys, eight personal accounts series, five story series, three monograph series, 10 books of native studies, 18 works of translation, and a part. It's in a pear tree. John. Uh, thank you, Moses, I guess. <laughs> Idea City is such an agreeable experience that I feel I know each and every one of you personally, and I have the sense that I am addressing 500 friends not 250 pairs of eyes or 250 pairs of ears. But having said that, <clears throat> allow me to state that I feel intimidated up on this stage, as have a number of other presenters who have commented on the decor of the stage. I noticed this rifleman who's now going to blast away at this beautiful Steinway will probably hit me as well. I thought about this last night, and I came to an interesting conclusion. Do you remember the motto of Idea City? Ideas change the world? Or our perception of ideas, or our perception of the world is changed by ideas. I want to perform a little act which I think will alter our perception of the implied violence on this stage. <laughs> uh, the poet Auden said, guns and roses are necessary. John Robert Colombo built a career overestimating the curiosity of Canadians. <laughs> I am now quoting a commentator from British Columbia who is quite right, and I want to share with you my passion in presenting and dramatizing Canadiana for a mass publish, a public in a large number of popular reference books. I'm not going to be promoting any single book, although I will mention some by name, and some are available, of course, in the bookstore. But seriously, these books have, some of them anyway, have become part and parcel of the educational establishment and the media and corporate sector. It all started really in 1967 when I was looking for the source of a Canadian quotation and I could not find it. The quote is one you are intimately familiar with. And I need say only, the medium is the message. And you will immediately think, 
Marshall Mc... That's what I did. But for a CBC broadcast, I wanted to know the year Marshall McLuhan had first formulated that remark. I looked, I could find no place. I did discover a book, Understanding Media, 1973, 19, right, which included, <laughs> I think Mr. McLuhan is here, <laughs> which included that phrase for the first time in printed form. But I was a student at the University of Toronto in the late 50s, and I was, I'm sorry it isn't McGill, by the way, <laughs> and I remember hearing the remark, the medium is the message, many times. So what I did was I wrote a letter, dear Dr. McLuhan, I would like to know when and where you first introduced the phrase, the medium is the message. It's becoming rapidly part of our cultural knowledge its core knowledge. And Marshall, as I came to know him, phoned up and said, come to one of my seminars at the Coach House and we'll find out. So that was a wonderful invitation. So I went to three seminars before I had the opportunity to ask him, when did you first say the medium is the message? And uh, Marshall's memory was going a little bit, but he said, uh, Harley Parker, when did I first say this? Harley was his assistant. Harley said, I don't remember, but Eugene Holman will remember. Eugene Holman was a CBC uh, bureaucrat with a photographic memory. He was there at the time. So I wrote a letter to Eugene Holman saying, when did Marshall McLuhan first say the medium is the message? He says, you will know this. And right away I received a letter from Holman saying, it was in the home of Alan Thomas on the campus of the University of British Columbia following a seminar on music and the arts. And the date was July the 30th, 1959. <laughs> Would that research were like this all the time. <laughs> I gave this uh, copy of this letter to Marshall and I asked him, is this so? And he said yes and signed it. So I was able to publish that information uh, in a number of my quote books. It's a standard touchstone remark. And I feel very proud of it because it was an instance of very successful research. The information is not included in the standard biographies of McLuhan. They haven't checked my reference books and they don't know that it's correct there. Marshall McLuhan also said the medium is the massage, but I never bothered searching for that. <laughs> Researching quotations has been very easy here because my wife, Ruth, has been with me and she jotted down a number of remarks. And I'm going to share one of them with you. Yesterday afternoon, we were privileged to hear Preston Manning say the following thing. Canada is the only country founded on the relentless pursuit of a rodent. <laughs> now that is going to appear in my next quote book. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't uh, file it under rodent, it will be under beaver. <laughs> Not all research is 100% successful. For instance, in 1985, a friend of mine sent me the following quotation, which I love, I think it's great. And he said, it was first voiced by a certain television producer named Moses Neimer. And it goes like this, if you're born in a city like London or Paris, you know you were born to one of the oldest cultures in the world. If you're born in a city like New York, you know you were born to, one, to be one of the kings of the world. But if you're born in Toronto, that's destiny. <laughs> <laughs> Truth to tell, I had that quote, but I didn't have it from its author. So I keyboarded it, this was long before personal computers, and I sent it to Mr. Snymer saying, did you say it? Well, could I publish it? What does it mean? I'm still waiting for the answer. <laughs> 
But if you check the Dictionary of Canadian Quotations, you will find under Toronto this remark, but I hedged, I weaseled. It says, attributed to Moses Neimer. <laughs> now, my name is the second name everyone checks in the indexes to my books. The first name is your own name. Everybody checks their name because they think, well, maybe sneakily, John Robert Colombo found a quote that, I, that I, I uttered that wonderful bon mot. And indeed, I try to do that, but uh, I can't always find quotes from everybody to include in my books. What I would like to do, though, is to share with you my favorite of my quotes, because I did include one in the book, because it has become very well known. And like Alexander Graham Bell, I want to fight to retain my recognition <laughs> of it. It's called O Canada. It's called, Canada could have, it's, it goes like this, Canada could have enjoyed English government, French culture, and American know-how. Instead, it ended up with English know-how, French government, and American culture. <laughs> that was written in 1965, and I'm really sorry to say that, uh, unfortunately, it's as true as it ever has been. One of the things I delight in doing in my book is discovering certain lost pieces of Canadiana. For instance, there's a wonderful limerick, a clean limerick, <laughs> that probably many of you know, and I'm going to recite it from memory and ask you to fill in the final word. It's a clean limerick. It's called relativity. There was a young lady named Bright whose speed was much, much faster than light. She traveled one day in a relative way and returned on the previous night. <laughs> I had memorized that when I was a kid, relativity. I didn't know until I started digging that it isn't anonymous. It isn't by unknown. It's written, it was written by a botanist at the University of Manitoba named Reginald Bullard, who is widely respected there. There's a, a Bullard Library, I believe, and no one there seems to know that he's the author of this limerick, which he submitted to Punch magazine, where it appeared anonymously. I've talked lately about the quotations. I think there's a serious reason why we should preserve our heritage of eloquence and insight and wisdom, because it encourages the younger generation to rise to that level. If we simply allow the Americans or the Brits or whomever to put together our popular reference books, we're going to be denied our own special flavor. I don't have a philosophy of quotations, but I do have a theology of quotations. A word is used by the Tibetan Buddhists, and that word is terma. The word terma refers to a sacred scripture or an object of great value which is hidden, buried, or secreted away to preserve it so that at some later date it may be unearthed for the guidance of man and woman. I believe these remarks to be termas. I have found them, I've gathered them together, I've created a treasury of termas where anyone with access to a book at a library or on the internet could check and find a terma which may bring delight, instruction, or even perhaps, in some cases, enlightenment. So that is my theology of quotations. But I do other things beside quote people, but I love doing it. Other things I do, I could talk about my Penguin Book of Canadian Jokes, and I must say you've heard some of those uh, jokes, but not the ones I would normally tell from a platform. But I would like to talk very briefly about a book I put together called Mysterious Canada, 
It's now out of print, so I'm looking back a bit. It appeared in 1979 when I decided what I wanted most to do was to explore a new tradition in Canadian culture, and that was the tradition of ghosts and spirits and mysterious disappearances. And in gathering this material together, I ultimately was able to publish a book of 500 mysterious events that took place in Canada. And to my astonishment, bringing this material together, I learned something, that at least a dozen world mysteries, mysteries you see in books by Colin Wilson and others, historical mysteries, are deeply Canadian. I hadn't realized that. The Mary Celeste is a mystery vessel and is the greatest, its disappearance in the mid-Atlantic near the Azores is the greatest mystery of the sea, bar none. Its remains were recently discovered off the uh, coast of Cuba, so it was in the news lately. But I discovered it was built and christened at Parsborough, Nova Scotia, and was a jinxed or hoodoo vessel from the day it was launched, not on the day it, dis it was found abandoned in the mid-Atlantic. Now, that's sort of interesting. Also, I discovered Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster. Everybody's heard of Nessie. Canadians have heard of Ogopogo, which is found in the depths of Lake Okanagan. Not many people realize that Nessie is junior to Ogopogo, and Ogopogo was not only sighted before Nessie was sighted by a full year, but the same publicist who published the accounts of the first sightings, modern sightings of Ogopogo, also arranged the first sightings of Nessie. <laughs> Public relations. Of <laughs> the birth, death, and resurrection of the modern spiritualist movement took place in the hands of Canadians. Moses has given me an extra 60 minutes to talk about this, so. <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about it in detail, but these are some of the mysteries you will find in my book. What I want to do is to leave you with the following, my favorite quotation. It appears in all my quote books. Canada only needs to be known in order to be great. It was first uttered by J. Castell Hopkins, a Toronto editor, 103 years ago. And by it, I understand that Canada only needs to be known in order to be great, is that Canadians need only to know themselves in order to release the wonderful talents and abilities, intelligence, emotions, and intuitions they have. So by J. Castell Hopkins' term, uh, statement, Canada only needs to be known to be great, I understand this to mean that what we must do is assess our own intuitions, emotions, and ideas in order to bring an end to war and destruction, and also to be able to look ourselves in the eye and say, Canada, is a most exciting place, and because of all the mysteries that have occurred here, it's also a very scary place. Thank you. Thank you, John. That's it. Uh, hang on, let me get in there. <laughs> Thank right. you very much.